everybody. Welcome to the panel discussion. This is our first one as a joint collaboration. We've never done that, and we thought it would be great to join forces. And uh, Jimmy is awesome, so I'm sure our event will be great too today. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself because most of you haven't met me yet. Um, I'm Meghna Joshi. I'm the director for EDI and Justice for uh, AI Orange County. And I'm also a senior project manager with Little Diversified in Newport Beach. And my name is Jamie Intervallo. I'm the director of equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice for AI San Diego and also an architect with LA. Yeah. What does LPA stand for again? Lisa and Pomeroy and Associates. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to go ahead and get started with our formal program. We have a lot ahead of us. Magna, I'll go ahead and let you introduce the topic today. Okay. Uh, today, we are going to talk about closing the affordable housing gap. Uh, it's been a topic on everybody's mind for the past few months especially now with the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement and all that, it's more than relevant and it's high time that we all took um, actions with it. So today we have two guests. Uh, one of them is Rochelle Mills and the other is Jared Basler. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Rochelle to you. Rochelle is the president and CEO of the nonprofit developer Innovative Housing Opportunities. She has a background in architecture and um, she has served on South LA Planning Commission too. She's on several boards, uh, nonprofit positions as well, but the notable one is Kennedy Commission that advocates production of houses for Orange County families earning less than $20,000 annually. I think Rochelle is doing great work and uh, I hope today she can share a lot about what she does and how she manages this company and uh, how she's making a difference in the affordable housing market. And Mr. Uh, Jared Basler here is uh, not foreign here to the San Diego community. He's a new school alumni, as well as architect and one of the founders of Maxible Space. And he is known as the godfather of the granny flats for a reason and previous AIA San Diego Ar uh, Young Architect of the Year. So um, we're happy to have him here today to talk about his uh, new grounds that he's is forging in the, in the market of ADUs that a lot of uh, personal folks are now getting into and, and as a way to help with affordable housing issues. So we'll, we'll dive into those topics today. So for the people who didn't introduce themselves, are we doing an introduction? No. No. Now, if you can mute Nick, um, and then we'll get in the presentation. So I think we, we lost your uh, audio, Magna. So um, I'll go ahead and, and just introduce this slide. So one of the one of the key things for this week is it's the um, it's a Martin Luther King holiday this past Monday, and towards the end of his life, Dr. King focused on equitable housing, and he was uh, instrumental in inspiring and helping draft a lot of the articles of the 1968 Fair Housing Act, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, disability, family status, and national origin, you name it. But it really wasn't only until after his death that Congress bolstered enough support to pass it. And so one of the topics that we were curious about is, you know, now 53 years later, how far have we really come? And so I guess uh, we kind of pose that uh, first question uh, here to, um, to Rochelle and Jared about that. Um, but before we do that, we'll go ahead and introduce uh, the charities that today's event is um, benefiting. Magna, did we get your audio back? No. Okay. 
can't hear yet. Okay, so um, so we're asking all the participants today to possibly please uh, consider donating to these three charities. You can see them on every.org in the uh, registration if you donated to AA San Diego, that's directly benefiting the inaugural Women in Architecture Scholarship. This particular scholarship is geared towards diverse, low-income kids in, in greater San Diego area and Southern California. And so thank you for your donation today. The last time we looked, we had $135, which is great. The other two organizations uh, are noted here. I believe we have a speaker uh, from the United Way that will be introducing that charity. I think everyone's audio may be having some trouble. Um, and then of course, Feeding America. So I think right now during the pandemic, Feeding America has been one of the most important organizations to help provide the support that families need across the country as we're still struggling with unemployment and um, issues. So um, we hope that everyone will consider donating. All three organizations are listed in every.org and they're under our nonprofits for AIA San Diego. Magna, I think you're back. Are you back? I think so. Okay, think so. I'm sorry. Um, there are a, <laughs> it's okay. There are a couple of speakers that didn't get the right link and uh, they're not able to log in yet. So I was trying to help them and that's, that's okay. It's okay. You took care of it. So Thanks, Jamie. We'll have, uh, yes, of course. We'll have a link in the chat to these organizations so you can go ahead and take a look. So we'll go right straight to our first question. Uh, Magna, did you want to introduce this one? Sure. Um, so uh, we'll start with the Jimmy. Why, why don't you go ahead and take it? I'm getting another okay. call. Sorry about oh, that. Oh, okay. Guys. No worries. Okay. So. What's interesting and sad was that there was a recent expose done uh, by uh, several uh, on real estate agents in Long Island. This study went over several years, three years to be exact, and um, journalists went undercover as potential home buyers. And they were journalists of all different you know, ethnicities. And what they found, this is a little uh, map of what it showed, but agents most of the time gave more housing choices to Caucasian folks than they did to diverse folks. I'll put a link in the chat room about the expose. It's, it's really sad. And you know, we were just talking about this historic act in 1968 who would, should have stopped this, but it's really not. It still goes on today. And so I guess, um, Megna and I were just curious what both, you know, Jared and Michelle think about that. Have we really come that far? I guess we'll, we'll pose the first uh, question to Jared. So being the token white guy on the um, <laughs> call. Um, no, I, I, I think that we really haven't come as far as we had hoped to and, and as, as far as we might have thought we had. Um, and, you know, we, uh, with the other presenters, we talked, uh, couple of days ago about a project that I'm getting ready to submit to the city right now. And we, and we uh, had, uh, as it was closing, got the CCNRs, you know, these are the old CCNRs that are not really part of an HOA, but more of a community. And so it was a, it was a, <laughs> a, a great reminder of uh, where we've come from. And Why don't you go things... ahead and introduce this one I have on the screen? This yeah, is real so... guys. Yes. Yeah, so, and this is something that is, <laughs> very widespread. Um, it's something we see in a lot of communities in the Fair Housing Act help, you know, put this to, you know, bed legally. But, um, you know, it really, the, the, the problem here is that the CCNRs for that community uh, wouldn't allow people of color to live in the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, graciously, every other um, condition of the CCNRs would have an expiration date except for that one. And it, it, it's so frustrating to to look back at this and, and see um, kind of where we come from and what, what we're still having to deal with. And, you know, Amanda Gorman yesterday in the inauguration and her um, her poem, you know, the, the line of it's it's because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. And that like really hit me as like there's things that we are 
still dealing with and things that we're still uncovering about um, just our everyday lives that are steeped in, in racism and things that are policies that are not, um, that, you know, we're not proud of, you know, I'm not proud of the past, um, but it's not how we, you know, we, we don't hide it. We, we move forward and we try to repair those things. So I think what was most shocking to us was that this is an actual project you're working on right now. Yeah. This was yeah. a CCNR and obviously this is not valid, but yeah, you would have. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's interesting from the standpoint that I, I see these all the time. So I, I, I get, you know, I, I do get a little numb to the fact that, yeah, that does not apply anymore. It's not legal. You know, there's, if, if you look in the first page of the Tyler report, it explicitly states that this is not legally binding, but the fact that we have to say that is for me, you know, eye opening and, you know, something that I'm continually, you know, coming up against. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to get your take on it, Rochelle, and how, you know, obviously this is different for us. Um, you know, it, it's something I see and, and I'm, I kind of feel, I feel pain because I understand the pain that others feel. And so, yeah, you know, it, it stinks in, in, in one regard, but I have to say, um, I value having it. So don't forget, you know, I, I, yeah. I have always, when, when I was doing, um, uh, residential architecture. My clients would always tell me about these covenants. They would always have great pain, but they would never yeah. share it with me. And I would just say, you know, could you just give me a copy? I just, I just want a copy from, but they would never share it. And I thought, well, you know, your pain doesn't help me out any, <laughs> you know, yeah. I know you didn't do this, you know, I didn't, but I would love to have a copy so that I could share it with my family and say, this is what your grandparents went through. But, yeah. uh, you know, one after another would say, you know, I just feel terrible. And they, they tell me about it. And I always felt the burden of having to listen to them feeling guilty about <laughs> it. So I, yeah. you know, that, uh, yeah, I, I think sometimes we, you know, it's just nice to, to remember where we come from. Um, it's true. Now, in terms of, so, uh, sure, yeah. Um, it will come a long way, um, there is still a long way to go, but what are your thoughts about short-term scalable goals for equity in housing? Hmm. Um, short-term goals, and I guess what you're asking is what can we do now to affect change? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, COVID gave us a really good opportunity to restart. Most of affordable housing, uh, well, all of, most of affordable housing is completely dependent on public funding sources. Public funding sources are dependent on tax increment. What COVID did is it sent all of the businesses home. There are no tax dollars coming in. And so a lot of my projects, our projects, and those of our colleagues are either at risk of losing their funding or at, at best being pushed off 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. What that does is that that means that the state and the federal government has to figure out solutions to plug those gaps. If you don't have a sense of urgency behind it, it won't happen. Mm -hmm. And so to me, we've got a perfect storm here. You've got projects that have already been earmarked and approved. They have already been entitled. They've already gone through that process. Uh, you have um, bond measures that the public has approved. They are seeing this proliferation of people sleeping on the streets outside of their homes. They want something to happen now. And with that storm happening, the policymakers know they have to move quickly. And they have, they're, they're willing to do listening tours and find out, uh, you know, what can we do? This is, a re to me, if d housing developers and those housing advocates don't take this time to go and 
and voice what they'd like to see, then we have wasted a great crisis. Yeah. That's my thought. We have a moment in time, a very small window where we can push for things that probably never would have gotten done because you know, we have, uh, you know, the great red tape that just says, let's keep doing it how we're doing it. And, you know, we'll wait another 10 years. We've got this amazing opportunity to push things through and we just have to seize it. Yeah. Totally and, agree. Yeah. And, and I see some, some great parallels with what you're saying, Rochelle, and, and how there are some opportunities that are opening up that we are being able to seize upon um, and, you know, talking with you about the differences between your affordable housing experience as a developer. And as I'm, you know, I'm just jumping into this from the affordable housing side um, as an extension of ADUs. And so it's, it's really an interesting um, kind of dichotomy between the, the publicly funded side and kind of this behind the scenes um, invisible density um, that we can do with ADUs and how there's been some programs that have opened up for kind of seizing that, that opportunity that uh, mm -hmm. is, is so important right now. Absolutely. Actually, now that you talk about that, um, Jared, you're, you're known as the God of the granny flats. Can you, that's an interesting story. Will you share how that came to be? Well, that, that's, I think, less important um, than, you know, kind of talking about where we have a, a great opportunity right now. Um, mm -hmm. I, this is not a new typology. Um, this is something that's been around for a really long time. Um, and it also has its, you know, some roots in, you know, um, the, the typology itself has roots in things that are, that I'm not so proud in, you know, servants quarters and other things that kind of all melded together into this kind of like second unit um, on a single family property. And it really kind of fell out of um, popularity after World War II as we started to expand and promote this American dream kind of mentality um, living in the suburbs. And the idea that, um, you know, we have flexible housing opportunities that are not just for, um, that aren't, they're not, singular in purpose, but have the opportunity to um, be flexible for any number of reasons mm -hmm. um, is really why um, accessory dwelling units, granny flats mm -hmm. have gained in popularity and are, are such a great opportunity now. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really something that helps us kind of bridge the gap from where we were to where we need to be in the future of having more opportunities for flexibility in, in housing, mm -hmm. more units available and um, opening up other opportunities as far as, um, you know, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the San Diego uh, ADU bonus program and how that's kind of impacting things moving forward. What we thought was just so interesting about it, you talk about the housing crisis and is a scalable way that the average person can contribute, can help. Yeah. And also it's, income to them so it's a two-way winning street and um and you know it's interesting because i think you had mentioned before you're you're kind of doing this with blinders on right you don't have to there's a lot of that red tape you're not dealing with because it's yeah. it's one-on-one -on -one with the family that you're renting from you're sharing a plot with them so well and and i think that architecture has always had like the the reason why a lot of us got in architecture was because we were able to impact people's lives in a positive way through design. Um, and residential architecture is a great example of how you can do that one-on-one -on -one with a homeowner. Um, looking at accessory dwelling units and how they, um, the opportunities that they provide, it's, kind of twofold. You're able to not only improve the lives of the homeowners, but you're able to improve the lives of the future occupants of that uh, space as well. You're creating housing units that are able to, um, you know, not impact more than just the, your clients. Um, but you're also able to 
tie into a, in a lot of circumstances, a capitalist um, need for that homeowner to be able to make money on it, or you're able to bridge gaps politically that allow you to Mm -hmm. do good and also help your client make money in a way that Mm -hmm. is, eh, I've, I've often described ADUs as kind of like a way to bridge the political gap and to kind of create unity because we can talk about as a, a way to exercise your rights on your property to build what you want, build housing for your family, friends, and community. Mm-hmm. And everyone kind of reacts to a different part of that statement, but it's really a, a it benefits more than just the homeowner. It benefits the whole community and, and adds housing where it wasn't before. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Jared, how do you think we can bring awareness to this through architecture, or policy making, or even community involvement? So when we, when we talk about like ADUs, granny flats, and this like typology in general, it's a typology that of, of clients that have never experienced architecture before. And so as a professional, um, I have to remember that this is a client that has never gone through this process. And so the, the way we handle those clients, and especially like at Maxwell, our whole goal is to, you know, we're, we're trying to build a world where everyone has a home. Mm-hmm. And the idea is that we want to make that as accessible to people as possible. So they don't have to have gone through these renovations and understand construction and the process. We want to simplify that as much as possible. And so trying to, as professionals, trying to remember that we're that probably that client's first interaction with architecture and design and framing our interactions in that way will help, um, provide it kind of the joy back to us as well as to the client to help them realize what they're trying to build. Mm -hmm. So Rochelle, like back to the topic of community engagement and, you know, how that differs in the ADU world to the traditional affordable housing world that you're dealing with. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that, on how that affects your process as a developer? Architect? Yeah, you know, what we've been dealing with is a, a lot of uh, PR challenges. And, and it, it, some of it is very, some of it is warranted. You know, people have put a lot of money in. They don't understand why it takes so long. Uh, they're, you know, putting us in the same category as Trump and every other uh, profit motivated developer. Uh, But we do have, we are mission driven. Affordable housing developers, particularly nonprofit developers are mission driven, meaning our priority is the good of the community, the legacy that we leave, the, the impact that we have, the ability to take a family and move them from dependence on public subsidy to independence. Whether that means they stay in the home uh, in, in the affordable unit or move out in, and onto their own. But some of the things that have been put together to make that process as democratic as possible actually end up being the very things that cause uh, the, the cost of a project. Mm. Um, so for example, we hear quite a bit uh, that you can do a market rate development for $250,000 a unit the average uh, affordable unit is really going to be around $500,000. Uh, if you're in wow. uh, the Bay Area, it's going to be pretty darn close to a million dollars a unit. Uh, there are several reasons for that, but not the least of which is along with this sea of red tape. Uh, we have performance measures that include community outreach, um, we become the, the, uh, the, what do you call it? The holders of all of the public's goodwill, green technology, uh, accessibility. Um, mm-hmm. they, they want great architecture. 
They wanted to rival the neighboring commercial development. But remember, we have to hold these properties for 55 units, uh, for 55 years, which means we can't put, um, you know, we can't put plastic laminate in the kitchens. Mm -hmm. We have to have, in that 50 year, 55 year time span, we will probably not be able to refinance that building for another, for the first 15 years. So whatever we put in on day one, we will probably, you know, to the best of our ability. So the construction cost, and then you've got uh, the, the, you know, labor requirements it depends on who supported it. You might have, mm -hmm. um, you, you have all kinds of things that a private developer doesn't have. What we found that was surprising to us is the, the goodwill and the best intentions in terms of community engagement. Uh, and, and I use the term, sometimes that can be weaponized. Uh, hmm. Everybody knows about CEQA. All you have hmm. to do is make a claim. There is no recourse. I mean, you put it out there, you don't, if you had to have some skin in the game, you would probably eliminate that. And I will tell you a story. We had a project in San Diego County in Carlsbad where the city uh, worked with us in 2013 to acquire 26 of 27 duplexes. So we essentially bought the entire neighborhood. The mm -hmm. goal was to build 141 units. That's 2013. Okay. We are now in 2021. After a series of, you know, the, the electeds changed, the mayor changed, the staff moved on, the community, you know, put together a, um, a uh, challenge, you know, they wanted to have some questions. So, and I, and I believe that that is the right thing to do. They want to understand what's coming. They want to make sure that you've got some community benefits. That's another thing. Do we have community benefit space? Can they, uh, can they use our parking lot? Can they travel through our property and, and, and those kinds of things? But a CEQA challenge was brought to us not by an actual resident, but by someone whose Airbnb property backed onto our property and they held up the project for three years. During this period of time, the cost of construction goes up considerably. So every year it went up by a million dollars. By the time we finally found that there was a loophole that allowed us to force those who were putting the challenge to put a $50,000 bond up to keep the challenge moving forward. And they uh, were able to walk away. The project was no longer feasible. Yeah. As of today, we are hoping that we will be able to simply do a rehab of those original 1950s duplexes. That I got a great, I got a great opportunity for you, Rochelle. <laughs> we have lost 90 <laughs> units in seven years. Mm. So when you talk to the public and the community, and it took us a great deal of time to get them on our side, what they're going to see is that the city gave us seven and a half million dollars eight years ago now. Why didn't you deal, build something with it? My worry is that people are going to get fatigued and it doesn't matter the, um, all of the shenanigans in the background, however well-meaning they were, what they are going to see is that we took money from the taxpayers and we were not able to perform. Yeah. That's and the thing that worries me. One of the things that I see in that is the, the just NIMBY attitude in general is based off of a lot of kind of um, implicit biases biases that are not rooted in actual data. Um, it's a lot of just anecdotes and what, where you run into these things daily on much larger projects. Um, one of the things that has been afforded to the, the small scale and statewide, but also looking very much more down at city of San Diego and um, is 
opportunities for inclusion and incl uh, including uh, affordable ADUs to help um, to help these in neighborhood as a ministerial process where there's not that neighborhood pushback. Um, and so the project we were talking about earlier with the CCNRs, it's a single family home in Talmadge um, where per state law, we could put one ADU and perhaps a JADU and I won't get into JADUs and all that kind of ADU law. But because of the um, city of San Diego's really kind of visionary thinking about um, ADUs and affordable housing, there's a program that allows us to add unlimited ADUs to a lot. Um, as long as half of them are deed restricted affordable and where Rochelle is talking about the 55 year deed restriction. Um, the city really worked with the professional community uh, to understand what would actually make these pencil out for individual homeowners developers on a small scale so. We have the opportunity to 15 year deed restriction on uh, as affordable units to essentially build unlimited ADUs on that lot. So this single family home in Talmadge, what that equates to is it equates to a single family home and we're adding five ADUs. Now, three of those will be deed restricted for 15 years, um, but that goes through the um, typical ministerial process for ADUs. And what that affords us also is as we work through with the city to on the policy side, this is where like what we can do as professionals, but also what we can do as policymakers is really have that uh, communication between the two parties to understand whether the policy is actually gonna be able to be implemented in a way that actually makes it work or is it just lip service? So what we end up with is we end up with a single family home that has five additional units on it. Three of them are going to be deed restricted. And that uh, affordable housing agreement is going to be able to be put in second position so that even with a traditional Fannie or Freddie loan, there's not going to be the issues that you run into with financing. Um, so like what we're kind of developing in the city of San Diego is really uh, centered around empowering individual homeowners to be a part of this solution um, without running into the things that Rochelle is running into on larger projects and you know really making it as simple as possible for anyone to be able to take advantage of. And if I can add something that addresses uh, Michelle's point uh, about the half a million costs, because I've been hearing that cost uh, as well. And I'm trying to do something on the cost side of things. And by the way, Jared, as the other white guy, uh, I'm originally from Europe and I come to design later in life. So I, in a way, have a blank slate approach to design and building affordable. In Europe, the tradition, they do a lot more in the way of prefab housing, which allows them to lower the cost. It allows them the speed of delivery. So that's what I've been looking at, panelized mm. housing, which doesn't have the similar uh, restrictions that container homes have, that you kind of uh, stuck with a fixed model if eight by 40. Panelized homes, you don't have those restrictions. And I'm working on an ADU right now with a couple in Lemon Grove. And I've been trying to make them part of the process. So there's a collaborative process. And I'm on target at the moment to keep a 740 square feet uh, two uh, bedroom home at under 100,000, which of course is not going to be the number you're getting if you're building multifamily units. But as an indication that I think that there are definitely ways that you can keep the cost of building down. Also, as a, uh, somebody uh, has graduated in sustainable design, I might try. It look like we just lost Nick. Okay. Nick, you can leave the comment in the chat box. Oh, Janet, uh, speaking about question. the. Um, 
Yes. So Sorry. speaking about the um, ADR, um, there's been some steam gathering around having detail units, um, just like ADUs, but ADRs on the site. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so um, I, the, the one thing that I've kind of seen uh, in this, the pandemic has really brought this to, you know, everyone's uh, front of everyone's mind is that we really need the opportunity for flexible spaces. And we run into things all day long um, where zoning is the first issue that we, the, the, the first barrier that we run into. Um, and so when we look kind of like a historic timeline of when the uh, ADU laws were passed, the real reason why the ADU laws were passed back in 2017 was to strip out the zoning um, restrictions that would allow for that wouldn't allow for ADUs to be built on properties. So we're now running into all the other issues in engineering and engineering and building and code and all the other things, but we are allowed to build them. So when we talk about um, uh, accessory kind of retail units or accessory uh, commercial units, it's really about um, kind of opening cities and the state size to um, the opportunity for people for more than just a home occupation um, and looking at the, the real opportunity for people to um, run businesses out of their home. And so um, a lot of that can be done in an ADU or we have homeowners that are um, using their ADUs as offices, uh, especially during the pandemic. It came in really handy for me for a couple of months, um, but it's really about making sure that we have the land use and zoning uh, in place that allows for flexible use. Mm -hmm. Rochelle, um, similar question to you. How does that translate into affordable housing? Um, is there a way to provide micro working spaces or um, even, you know, first story retail spaces and make it sort of mixed use with low rise? Is that a possibility? It's not only a possibility, I think it's the responsible thing to do. Uh, a lot of mm -hmm. what we're developing is among, um, in uh, disadvantaged communities along under underutilized commercial corridors. And so a lot of affordable housing developers are, you know, the community is asking for it, the council people will not uh, approve a project unless it has some kind of commercial space. And so I think it's an amazing thing to do. What's, what's really interesting are, are the nexus, or are they nexi when it's more than one? Whatever the connections are with the different, um, uh, you know, you've got housing, health, arts, et cetera. What we've been looking at is that you've got a lot of developers who are cash flowing their projects as housing development so that they are not dependent on the revenue because we're housing developers. We don't know anything about um, uh, retail and commercial management, which is another reason why the, the cost of projects go up because we're having to do things that are beyond where where we're doing it. But when that happens, and when you've got someone who doesn't understand it from an architectural lens, you create spaces on the ground floor that a business can't move into. You know, you, you build this building and then you think uh, because you built it, they will come. Well, guess what? A 7-Eleven can't fit in a space that is 10 feet deep. And, you know, we create these spaces and then what, what the heck do we do with it? Well, what a lot of people are doing, particularly in the arts, is they're saying, let's reclaim those spaces for art uses. Artists, uh, you know, it is, it is shown that art and culture can revitalize a community in a way that other businesses can't. But they are also more creative and able to uh, turn those into live workspaces. You know, that ground floor is about 14 uh, feet tall. That is a, uh, uh, someone who can use it. And, you are, and it gives you an opportunity to get that rich diversity of residents, uh, businesses. Um, artists are those who really can find 
a value in their community, dig roots into the community. And so there is, to me, a win-win there. It is going to take some time to help uh, uh, electeds um, understand the value of writing those down to serve that population. And what's interesting to note is that 80% uh, of uh, artists uh, who, who self, what do you call it? Call themselves mm -hmm. artists mm -hmm. are at uh, tenuous housing circumstances. So you can take care of the housing challenge also bring a taxable income into the communities. And again, I, I will tell you that what COVID uh, made painfully aware is the need for properties, affordable housing properties to also generate tax revenue. To me, mm -hmm. this is a, a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. Take those empty and underutilized spaces. We've all seen them. Mm -hmm. You've got beautiful affordable housing projects with 3,000 square feet of space that's not being used. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it to me is criminal, but those can be used by uh, um, micro businesses. They can be turned into micro units mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. some flexibility in our zoning and planning codes. We can turn those into live workspaces. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that those are some of the things that when I talk about what are the policy platforms, those are the things that we should be jamming. Uh, you know, pushing for it. We can take more people off the street. We can revitalize communities using the stock that we already have. Exactly. What's the most sustainable housing or building type? An existing one. An existing one. Trick question. The highest and best use. <laughs> highest and best use. I Just a... I've never heard that, Jamie. I'm going to have to mm. turn that into my uh, into Oh, yeah. My own banged into my head and planning architecture school. So just quick follow on to your statement, Rochelle, some of the folks here in San Diego are starting to see an emergence of a lot of those shared spaces that are having micro businesses. I've seen uh, the salons come up mm -hmm. and, you know, Liberty, what Liberty Station has done to the old military base in Point Loma is phenomenal. And in one spot, you can get a diversity of awesome food. They have a bar, they have entertainment all in one spot, and it makes it, you know, accessible to, to smaller businesses, people just growing that don't have the money to pay for all the overhead for an office and staff and, and whatnot. So mm -hmm. definitely interesting. We are always looking at it. some of the things that we're looking at are new concept banks. You know, part of what we're looking at in, in affordable housing is how do we break the cycle of poverty. And what people have told us is, you know, getting into the uh, housing is important. And, and our motto says it starts with housing, but it can't end there. Uh, we're finding people are in, in communities of color. There is a proliferation of payday loans. Why people would trust that rather than a bank is beyond me. Mm -hmm. But here's another opportunity for a developer and architects to create the solution there. How do we create an unbank that gets people to come into it and combine that with the idea of a co-working space so that you've got people who are you know, using the Wi-Fi, doing who knows what, uh, something, and you've got a, a, a roving banker who can sit down and have a conversation with them about long-term planning and goals and why it's important to put your money down. And so you're, I, I think that there is such an opportunity for creative uh, housing developers and architects, planners, uh, you know, groups like, uh, I see Jill Shook on the uh, list, groups like theirs who are pro-housing to get together and help, help influence others to see this as a win-win. Most of the housing that we are creating has a community benefit uh, component, meaning we're creating community space on the ground floor that is open to the community. Let's create something that people are so fiercely proud of that that becomes the standard, that becomes the bar that everybody needs to move into. That's what I think. We, we really can do something amazing here. Totally agree. Well, 
on that, Magna, I think we'd like to leave uh, some time for questions. And so we did yeah. receive a few from Actually, the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. Jamie, uh, before we get into question and answers, uh, we have Doug Ruby too with us now. We finally figured out the right call number. Uh, why don't we ask Doug to share a little bit about United Way? Hi, Doug. I think we can unmute you here. Go on. I think I'm off mute. Can you hear there you me? Are. Yeah, there you are. Great. I, and I'm so sorry I was late, but uh, seemed to have the wrong uh, passcode and information there. But in any case, um, you know, it's interesting just recently um, hearing Rochelle talk about the financial aspect of this process and the education relative to financial. And one of the things that I love about United Way and why I'm so passionate about it is they're trying to help us solve this housing issue by not just looking at housing, but looking at the roots that get people in a position that keep them from being able to be able to afford a house or end up being homeless. And so they have four areas in particular in Orange County that they focus on its education, its health, its housing and its income. And so, you know, what I love about that is that they're, they're really looking at the root causes of some of the issues that we are experiencing in many of our communities. Um, education in particular is one that's important to us as a design firm, you know, we design education facilities. We do lots of kinds of projects, but um, our ability to partner with, with United Way on their Youth Career Connections Program, where they're bringing in young students to see what happens in a design firm and the kinds of opportunities that exist for them so that it motivates them to continue on with their education and graduate from high school to be able to eventually go to college and make a good income to be able to afford a house. Um, they're very focused on health and uh, cutting childhood obesity. You know, obviously if you're healthy, you're more likely to do better in school and a whole host of other things that then put you on a path to success in the future. Mm -hmm. And the income one, which was just being brought up is really important. They do, yeah, they do financial assistance in certain scenarios. But more importantly is helping coach people on understanding how to manage a household from a financial aspect at the most very basic levels. And early on, even in the grade school and the high school level, so that when they get out into the real world, they can do that and not put themselves in a position where they're going out and getting a payday loan that's, you know, just ridiculous, which is, is not healthy for them in the long run. We all know that. I mean, so... Um, what I would tell you is, you know, look into the United Way in your local communities. Um, during this pandemic, they immediately pivoted here in Orange County. They created a pandemic relief fund and have been able to raise almost five and a half million dollars that they're putting directly to families to help them be able to get housing or maintain housing to keep from getting in, in a, themselves in a position where they lose their housing. Um, to make sure the kids have the, the things they need to be able to continue on with their education. Um, that's been vitally important uh, during this pandemic. Connectivity and hardware to be able to just do education in many cases is something that many of these people don't have. So, um, you know, they're a wonderful organization. If anybody ever wants to talk about them more, I'd be glad to, to speak to you individually. But um, I really do appreciate your time and, and listening to me a little bit. And hopefully you'll look into them. And um, they do have a scorecard. I will tell you this. They do a scorecard event here in Orange County every year. They say, here are the things that we're trying to accomplish. Here's what we're trying to do in each one of those areas. And here's where we are. They're holding themselves accountable. And they're being very mm -hmm. transparent. Here's what we said we were going to do. This is where we are in that process. Here's where we need to continue to do work. And one of the ones that's really great for me is on the income side is that, you know, they wanted to reduce financial instability in, in our community. Um, they met the criteria that they set and then they raised the bar and said, okay, we want to do it another 25%. They didn't settle for just getting that done. They said, let's keep on going in that area. They haven't met all the criteria in the other areas. So they're continuing to push forward, but knowing them, 
as they meet these things, these goals that they set, they're going to raise the bar for themselves to continue to make our community better. So awesome. that's my, uh, that's my pitch to you guys. Magna and I just want to thank everyone. Thank you to Jared and Rochelle for being our gracious panelists today. A lot of really good learning um, about the topic of affordable housing, both in ADU and traditional uh, affordable housing. Magna, I didn't know if you had any other closing comments. Um, no, I just want to say thank you. You all have been very patient with us today and great <laughs> questions, great discussions. Thanks, guys. 